Welcome into a special edition of Sportball. I'm your boy Sam. With me, as always, are the two most nefarious villains this world has ever seen, Seth and Kyle. How we doing? Do we ever have any just regular episodes I was, of Sportball? I would say the same exact thing. <laughs> you know, I was debating not saying special, but I figured we're covering both the NBA and the NFL. That's special, you know? Mm. I feel like we still do that most of them now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, on today's pod, we're planning on starting off with our NBA biggest surprises so far of the year, which, spoiler alert, will be, just be Kyle talking about his stogie boys and how he's not surprised by how well they're playing. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know me so and well. then we're going to dive into the wild, wild card weekend. I say wild twice because there's now six games instead of four. So clear your schedules and hunger down. Not like there's anything else to do anyway. Should we just dive right into it, boys? Sure. Why not? Oh, you don't have to all throw confetti in there. My God. All right. <laughs> Let's start off with the NBA. It's been or it's a huge caveat here, obviously, because it's only been two weeks of basketball. Most teams have played around eight games. So about 10% of the season is done. So, of course, there are some things that need to be taken with a grain of salt, especially with all the COVID situation, right, with different teams um, having to sit their players out due to those reasons or just in general rest of their players more with a condensed schedule. But I do think there are certain things we can take away, right, from from all the basketball we've watched so far. So we wanted to go over um, each of our three most surprising things that we've seen this season whether it be a player, a team, or just a general trend. So who wants to start? Who wants the who wants the uh, responsibility? I think Neither of them. Kyle, go ahead. Kick us off. Jeez, I knew it was going to be me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously, like you said, we're early in the season. We're kind of just getting glimpses of some of these new, you know, new faces and new places, new, uh, new identities to teams. Um, and I think that's kind of what a lot of our initial thoughts are about or kind of what's, what's different so far, what's different than kind of what we expected. Cause we didn't really have much to go off of, you know, not a real preseason, no summer league, nothing like that to kind of evaluate rookies or see how teams would be playing um, with new coaches. So the first one, I think I want to, start with is kind of the Pelicans, um, right? I think a lot of us had them, you know, kind of flirting on, will they make the playoffs? Will they not this season? Um, I know I, I said in our first NBA pod that I thought they'd be one of the playoff teams. I didn't really think, um, you know, they might end up in like that nine, nine seed spot, but I think that they could really fight for that eighth, maybe seven spot. Um, and, it's been a little bit of a slow start, I feel like, but they've also, you know, looked really good at times too. Um, now, with uh, with Bledsoe, he took a couple games, kind of it seemed like, to kind of get uh, I don't know if used to the the system or what. But um, the last couple games, the last two or three games, he's really settled down. He looked a lot better, um, and it's really interesting too. They're running pretty much 100% of the time where, you know, excluding blowouts or anything like that, um, the Pelicans either have Bledsoe or um, Brandon Ingram on the floor at all times. It's like, that's who they want one of those two on the court at all times to kind of be the facilitator. I kind of like that. Um, Lonzo hasn't really had that facilitator role a lot this year so far. Um but that's okay because I feel like his um, his three point shooting, you know, seems better than last year. Definitely better than the bubble. He couldn't score for shit in the bubble. Right. Um, they look they look good, and you know their style of defense too. I think that was a lot of questions coming in. Was like, well, can they even stop anyone? Right? Are they going to be able to keep up with teams? Um, they're top 10 right now in the, in the league in defense. And I think it's really interesting how they're doing it too. They kind of seem to be going the Milwaukee Bucks route where completely pack the paint and don't let anybody score at the rim. If we're going to get killed by three, if a team's going to get hot, 
we'll let them get hot. We'll lose that game. That's fine. But they're going to bank on teams, you know, not shooting an outrageous percentage from three and preventing them from the easiest shot that there is in getting to the basket. So overall, um, impressed with the Pelicans still definitely think that they're going to be one of the playoff teams. And that's what I'm really excited to see. I really want to see Zion, especially and Brandon Ingram. Those two are just such a force. It's kind of crazy. Like Brandon Ingram, he can't generate space. I feel like, but he doesn't need to. His length, his arms are so long. It doesn't even matter if someone's like defending him in his face. He shoots right yeah. over. Him. I, um, I like this team more than I thought I would. So yeah. maybe a little surprise to me too. Um, I, I like what you brought up with Lonzo because I heard someone say early in the season, maybe it was their coach even, I don't even know, but that he should be a point guard in transition and a wing in the half court offense. And that seems obvious to say, and that's kind of how I think of him, but that's like more how they're running their offenses here. Like you said, with Bledsoe and Ingram doing the distributing. Um, defensively, we'll see if it keeps up. They're fourth right now in defensive rating, but adjusted for opponents looks like they're ninth. So we'll see if they start playing better offensive teams. But I do think a lot of it is real. Um, like you said, limiting shots at the rim and letting people take threes. I do still feel like, and they're young, I do still feel like Zion and Ingram especially just let blow bys and back cuts happen a couple times a game every time I watch them. So there's some shoring up to do there still. But I, I agree that I have been surprised by how good this team has been so far. Yeah, I have too. And I've been kind of a skeptic of the Pelicans the last year or two, just with all the hype. Um, around Zion and you know I think it's deserved <clears throat> but you know we all kind of thought of them as a fringe playoff team last year and thought maybe they could make a run at the end of the season with Zion back and it was like oh they're really good if they just have Zion healthy and I just kind of want to see it first um, but certainly they're showing it to me early I mean they're four and three. It's not like they're undefeated, but, um, and we'll see uh, how that defense kind of works. I mean, it's worked well for the Bucks over the last few years. Um, but you just wonder if, ste- if teams start exploiting that and, you know, making their open threes. Um, and it's certainly an interesting team in the way it's constructed with some of these guys like Zion, where it's like, what position is he? Lonzo is like, what position is he? And then, you know, a traditional big like Steven Adams, who's maybe maybe his rebounding and shot blocking presence is really helping their defense compared to last year. So I still feel like they're in the playing game. Um, but yeah, you know, if they can keep it up and build off of this for the rest of the season, maybe they are a top six seed in the West. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be exciting. I mean, I'll be tuning in at least with that team that they're fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, Seth, why don't you give your first most surprising thing? Yeah, my my most surprising um, one so far is another team that I feel like is kind of overachieving and even even more of a leap from my expectations to what they've done so far, which is our old favorite, the New York Knickerbockers. Sam was just like two years late on his prediction. Yeah. That happens uh, sometimes. That the they best make of us. the playoffs. Was and, Matt, wasn't it? No, well, it was, both it was me one year, Matt the next year. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Nobody this year, which was our <laughs> big mistake. It's not really a mistake. <laughs> no, I mean, I still don't think. I mean, maybe they could make the play-in game, but I don't think they'll make the playoffs, um, even with their hot start. And they've got – I haven't watched a ton of Knicks this year, um, but it's it seems like it's really been just incredible performances from Julius Randle and Alec Burks both averaging more than 20 points a game so far. And then also just like all these players contributing something, right? There's been a lot of buzz last couple games about Emmanuel quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, He's nice. Coming in. Yeah. He looks pretty good. And then, you know, Obi Toppin's only played one game. So that, that would be the reason for optimism is getting Obi in, in the mix. Um, you know, and really seeing what this team can do. But I just, you know, you look at the Eastern Conference standings and to see where the Knicks are and where some of those other teams that we expected, like, 
Toronto, which maybe we'll get to them in a, in a little bit here, but it just feels unsustainable. And like you said, 90% of the season is yet to be played. So I think this is one where, Hey, it's a cool, uh, cool story early on. The Knicks look serviceable, but I could see them cratering later in the season. And by the end of the year, we're like, hell yeah. Remember when the Knicks started four and three? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't think this team is going to be a top seed in the East or anything. I think they could make the play in tournament. And I think that's probably their goal. I think the one real thing that we can take from this is that I think just Tom Thibodeau raises her floor, right? You know, I mean, we can assume no. that he just gets his team playing a little better on defense, um, moving the ball a little better on offense. Talent obviously still isn't there. So we're not going to expect them to catapult, you know, into anything but a playing team. But with, with Tom as the coach, I could see them, I could see them, you know, going for that 10, nine seed. So my theory on it is the Knicks aren't full of a bunch of trash players. Like everybody initially thought, they have good players, a couple. And they have so many injuries right now. And Tom Thibodeau is playing his starters like over 40 minutes a game. If any, if the Bucks were to, during the regular season, run their starters 42 minutes a game, they might lose three games a year. <laughs> That's, That's the thing, like, right? It's like yeah. if you're going to be playing starters yeah. more than like 65 70% of the time against second units – which is what he's doing right now, you'd right. expect them to do well. That's fair. Like, maybe we should have seen this coming because, you know, in Minnesota, he took that well, team like to I the said, first playoffs. Help. Right, and it doesn't help that they have, like, four or five injuries right now, too. Yeah, and and what he's done historically is he takes the team to the playoffs, raises their floor, and then in two years, all their stars are out of the league with knee injuries. So, <laughs> <laughs> so RJ, you have three years left. Um, all right, let's go to my first most surprising thing. The one and only Christian Wood. I was texting Kyle about this last oh. week. The man is averaging 24 and 10, two blocks so far for Houston. Obviously, they've only played a few games, but certainly gaudy numbers. And offensively, he's been outstanding. Defensively, and when I watch him, he could improve a little, but, you know. And this is this is a guy that came out of nowhere. I was looking it up. He had seventy two career games over his five play? seasons before last year. What's that, Seth? Before last year, okay. Yeah, yeah. And he was just basically a G League player before last year. And last year he had a decent run with the Pistons. The man doesn't even have a nickname on basketball reference. That's when you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You convinced me then. My I name, was gonna push back on that. It's but... Christian Too Good Wood. That's good. Let's You're put welcome. that in. Um, so good. If you donate, I'm pretty sure you could. If you donate to Basketball Reference, they'll uh, let you edit stuff on pages. How have we not done this yet? <laughs> I thought about it for Nikola Jokic, but they can only. I think you can only have like one person donate, and someone's already donated for Jokic, so I couldn't do anything. Uh, I was gonna say that could be how you get your German chocolate cake in for Schroeder. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on there already. Yeah. Um, but anyway, just I have my doubts going in. Um, Like, we know he played well with the Pistons over that stretch, but that's the first real basketball he's played over, you know, over a stretch. So I think I had reason to be skeptical. And he's incredible offensively, at least. And honestly, even if Harden leaves, I don't mind Wall and – I don't mind having Wall and Wood. It's a dirty two-man game. (laughs) Yeah, as just a couple of players to build around. So, yeah, I really like the way he's played so far. I was telling Kyle, it's like – it's almost as if Hassan Whiteside had been – like had the offensive skill set of like Carl Anthony Towns or something like the way, the way this guy comes out of the G league and I'm seeing him handle the ball and shoot threes with efficiency. It's, it's been great to watch and I'm, it's a good story. And I've been enjoying watching Houston for that reason. And that reason alone, because you know, I don't like watching them usually. Such a hater. Yeah. I think that was one where we kind of, I don't know if it's entirely surprising because when he went to Houston and we had talked the three of us before about, Oh, that could be really good for him. Like I could see him having another really good year building off of what he did in Detroit. And I feel like part of it was like, we, yeah, it was one year sample size, but I think if he hadn't been buried in Detroit and if he was on a different team that we watched more or that was in the playoffs, we wouldn't be as surprised as we are now. But he was also better than 
a lot of the players Detroit was rolling out to, and he just didn't see the court. It's it's crazy. It's like Sam said, he was talking to me about it, and it's like I've loved Christian Wood because I'm a weirdo and like watch summer league stuff, and he absolutely dominated summer league when he was, you know, there. Um, and he was just like a, a um, what did I say? Uh, a G League um, journeyman. Like he just yeah. went to a whole bunch of different teams. And then finally, you know, who was it? Was it the Pelicans? I think he had like one game where there was a bunch of injuries and uh, they let him play and he just went off for like 20 something points, 13 rebounds in like 18 minutes or something. <laughs> And then never saw the court again for the Pelicans. Detroit got him. You know, he played in 62 games, but he only started 12. But it was obvious that he was one of their best players, and they just let him walk and then decided to sign, like, six big men for some reason and let him go. Um, yeah, man, he's, he's like a unicorn. It's crazy. He's so good. He's, like, improved a lot, too, with his ball handling. Um, his – He's playing like 15 more, obviously only a couple games in, but compared to last year, he's playing like 15 more minutes a game. His usage percentage is higher already. Like if he's going to be playing 15 more minutes a game, even 12 more minutes than he was last year as a higher usage percentage, he's just going to be an animal. He's going to be a consistent, like he already is double, double threat every night. And he's in like the 85th percentile in the league and blocks too. like good luck. Honestly, it's like this is this almost never happens. Maybe it's never happened. Like people from the G League don't just come in, just don't end up averaging twenty four and ten when they're like twenty seven after six years of development, you know. And it's like, but I do wonder if this starts to happen more often as the G League expands and gets better with with its development of players and becomes kind of like the NBA's minor leagues. You know, this could be the he could be the first kind of um, person to pave the way for that. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah it'd be cool to see for sure. Uh, all right, Seth, give me your second most interesting thing. Surprising, so, interesting, whatever you want to say. Yeah, I'm going with the Sixers and their hot start, um, which obviously they were, you know, a, team, well, I, a year ago I picked them to win the championship last year, you know, so they're not, you know, like the Knicks where we all think they're ass. But, and then, of course, there were changes with um, Daryl and Doc coming in. Um, so we, we, and then the, you know, acquisitions of Seth Curry and Danny Green too, obviously helped. So we kind of expected that they'd improve, um, but to be top of the standings in the East six and one um, at the time that we're recording this, they play today against the wizards. Um, certainly encouraging for Sixers fans. It feels like from watching them, like they just mesh together a little bit better Um However, again, I'm going to say this is a little bit unsustainable. I still think they'll probably be a top four seed come playoff time, but I'd be shocked if they held the number one seed all year. And mainly that's because when you look at their schedule so far, which this kind of thing is bound to happen when it's this small of a sample size, right? So they've beaten the Wizards, the Knicks. They lost to the Cavs. And then they beat the Raptors, the Magic, the Hornets twice. So certainly not a murderer's row. Yeah. So you know, call me when they meet when they beat a good team. Um, but hey, that's what you're supposed to do is beat the teams that you're supposed to beat, and at least you know break even with the other teams at your level. So I will say that Cavs game that they lost. They did not have Embiid that game, and it was their mm-hmm. first, second, first back end back to back game of the season. Yeah, kind of a letdown and, spot. And the Cavs, I mean, with the backcourt like Sexland, how do you even defend that? You know, exactly. Um, what are you do? Greatest duo nickname of all time, perhaps. Yeah, it's uh, up there. It's definitely up there. But coming up, they've got the Nets, the Nuggets, um, Hawks, and the Heat. Are their next yeah, the, after today's game? So honestly, you know, the rest of this month is kind of nuts for them. Nets, Nuggets, Heat, Celtics twice, Lakers, yeah. Heat twice actually. Yeah, so I think we'll we'll learn a lot more about how real that team is 
over the yeah. next few weeks. Yeah, we'll touch base after they play real teams. But I will say that this is kind of the team I expected to see last year. I mean, they're first in defensive rating, which is kind yeah. of what we expected them to be last year. Right. And it's funny because they got rid of two solid defenders for two – you know, I well, mean, Seth Curry's not great defense, and Danny not at this point of his career. So, I mean, I feel they like have Danny's... the better Curry brother. So, right, <laughs> that's the truth. We've he's all never got the same opportunities. Yeah. He's got it now, and he's shooting over fifty percent from the three point line. I will say, yeah. I've been surprised by Seth having more um, offensive skills than I expected, even more than he showed in Dallas. I feel like maybe it's just because all he was asked to do in Dallas off of Luca didn't have shoot, the opportunity. But... He's got a little more. He's got a little more off the bounce, off the bounce. Yeah, um, yeah than I expected. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Kyle, who's your second most surprising thing? Um, I mean, I can't go a show without talking about the Denver Nuggets. So, um, all aboard the Big Honey MVP season. Uh, the man is just the man is nonstop. It's just outrageous every night. It's chalk it up for a triple double. And he, it's not even like, like it's efficient too. It's not like Russell Westbrook averaging a triple double in a season where he shoots like 38% from the field and he's taking 30 shots. Nicole is going to have average a triple double for the season as a big man and shoot a very efficient percentage. Um, the problem is, I don't know what that team's going to do about defense because Gary Harris might be the most washed player in the league. Uh, Paul Millsap is the worst in the app these days. Well, they don't play in an Applebee's, it seems like enough. So, <laughs> And I mean, um, and, and then, you know, Jamal's been very hot and cold to start the season. So, I mean, he had back-to-back games just the other day where he looked like bubble Jamal, where he dropped – 35 plus points and then last night against the Timberwolves he just took like seven shots I think he made like one of them he had like eight points or something and it's like that's how he started the season too so it's like if Jamal can ever be consistently not even as good as he was in the bubble but just consistent plus what Jokic can provide um they have everything I think that they would need to be a top tier offensive team. And I think they are, it's just yeah. a matter of, I don't know. They can't stop anyone on defense, yeah. but again, I think once everyone's healthy, that might not be a problem. So Kyle, I said this to Sam the other day and given your um, affinity for Nuggets players, I'm curious <laughs> to, to hear your reaction is Michael Porter Jr. Just a six ten version of Sackle Levine. That's a good question. <laughs> because uh, so far, I feel like he's just, you know, he puts up stats. He scores a lot of points. An absolute sieve on defense. Which, you know, we, we've we seen many years from Zach and kind of know what he is. And maybe Porter Jr. will improve. He's He's still very young. And maybe I just am salty about him because he – reportedly is an anti-masker so that could have something to do with my feelings but uh, you know, he doesn't I feel like he doesn't he's really play make he he's know. still so young he's only 22 yeah. he's only had like yeah. last year right he, he didn't really have a a full full-on season you know to kind of get incorporated then you had the short off season this year I'm still super high on Michael Porter I think he is going to end up being better than a Zach Levine. Um, I mean, right now I'm looking at uh, his defense and rebounding, just like simple stuff, right? For forwards, he's in the 97th percentile in block percentage, the 80th percentile in steals. Um, He's Yeah, he has the tools to be a better defender than than Yeah, he has everything. And I think think he can learn a lot from, you know, say like a Will Barton – like if if he's trying to learn, I think Will could be a great tutor into kind of teaching him because that's one of the hardest things, right? Is just knowing where to go. And that's one of those things like as a young player, if you're not coming out of college a great defender, you're definitely not going to be a great defender your first, second, third year in the league. But once you have those reps and that time and that opportunity, 
Uh, I think we see Michael Porter Jr. over the next, I don't know, within the next year or two, kind of take that ascension into top, you know, 10% of players in the league. Yeah, I'm still I'm still decently high on him. I think I honestly don't know if he'll ever be as good a scorer as Levine. The funny part of that is, I mean, Levine <laughs> Levine is averaging what like 28 points per game probably, um, and he'll certainly always be a better rebounder. And I think he has the length and size to be a better defender. Um, and like Kyle said, with the block and steal percentage, like he's getting those big plays, but off ball help and just kind of staying with yeah. people on the wing is hard yeah. for him right now. So. I think we need to give him some time, but definitely not there on the defensive end. I wanted to bring up, too, um, a couple of things that you reminded me of, Kyle. So, Jokic right now is averaging 24, 12, and 12, leading the league in assists. He's also leading the league in turnovers, which I noticed because he's on my fantasy team. And (laughs) um, he is – he's just – Excuse me. It just seems like he can turn it on at any time, right? Like I was watching the game yesterday and he barely scored it all in the first quarter and at 35 by the end of the game. Meanwhile, Jamal, on the other hand, I think this might just be the player he is. And I know everyone wanted him to say he would be an improved player after the bubble, but they were saying in the broadcast of the game I was watching that he was trying to go for 30 points in three straight games for the first time in his career in the regular season. He did that in the playoffs last year, obviously. And it's like, wouldn't you think he had done that by now? You know, that kind of type of score. Mm-hmm. And he hasn't because he's just so inconsistent. I just don't know if he'll ever become that consistent player. Um, but offensively, at least with Jokic there, I think that's okay. Defensively, they're 30th in the league, which is bad because there's there's 30 teams, as we know. So I think if they bump that up to middle of the league, we're still looking at the team we thought we were, but it's definitely concerning so far. Yeah, I think, like you said, Jamal doesn't have that game-to-game consistency on offense, but they don't really need him to. Their offense is already great. Yeah. And if he could focus in a little bit more and kind of like Jokic does, like you're saying, like you get the feeling watching him that he's always in control of the game. He lets the game come to him. He can turn to his scoring on and off at will, you know, depending on what the team needs at the time. And with Jamal, it feels like it's like, okay, does he have it or does he not on any particular night? And you can't really trust him to, like, just fill the gaps that the team needs. So I, I, my hope for the Denver Nuggets is that they can – that Jamal can figure out, okay, if I'm not – if I'm not lighting it up on offense, I'm going to really just dig in on the defensive end and shut some people down because if he's not doing either, it's – it's going to be tough for them to just be in a shootout every game. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Okay. Some of some of Jokic's passes this year have been absolutely insane. I've watched some of the breakdowns that I, I follow. <laughs> There's a, um, a Denver sports uh, coop that um, started like a couple years ago. Um it's called DNVR, obviously for Denver. They do really awesome breakdowns and stuff. Um, they were breaking down some of his passes. There was a, a specific pass from a couple games ago um, where Jokic just doesn't even look at all, and he just knows by the way, essentially, where two or three other of his teammates are and where the defense is going, exactly where I think it was Will Barton was on the court. And he's completely looking the opposite way and f- just throws it right, a perfect pass right into a corner three for Will Barton where nobody is around him because he's not even looking to make that pass. It's just nuts how he does that stuff. He's, he's a master of the true and of pass. Most guys, like, they just look away right as they pass it. This man he never just, looks. He doesn't look, yeah. <laughs> even at that half of the court before he throws it. Um, all right, let's, let's do my second most surprising thing um, for me, it's been Sabonis and the Pacers. So I, like many people, had them in kind of that six to seven range in the East. Didn't think they were an elite team. I should have known that they always outperform expectations. Um, they're five and two now. Sabonis is averaging 21, 11, and seven. Some would say he's a player that Kyle told us Bam would be this year. Um, 
<laughs> I knew. I knew we get mad about that. Jimmy's been hurt. I'm kidding. <laughs> so their new coach, uh, Nate Bjorken, Bjorken, I believe. I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but I really like the way he's running this offense now. Um, it really runs through Sabonis at, at the elbows, and it looks great. And I, I wonder, I do wonder how long Miles Turner and Victor Oladipo are going to be happy on this team because – Rodden and Sabonis are running really this team and as they know, should though as they should and they're doing well but we know that Old Depot probably has um probably has dreams of being bigger than that and we know that Miles Turner does too and that he's not probably just he's just a spot-up shooter right now basically and he's good in that role but I think he wants more so I'd be interested to see how that all plays out with the chemistry but I do like I really like how this offense is running under the new coach and it's been fun to watch yeah, I mean, with those pieces, if if they're all happy in their roles, they could be a real contender. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I said so, they weren't uh, weren't gonna make uh, make the playoffs, and I'm completely taking that back. I think they're in the top half of the of the seeds for the East after seeing how how well um, Yorkin, whatever the hell his name is, got this team running right now. Yeah, maybe we can use this to actually just pivot into my third most surprising thing because I feel like these two teams have flipped flip for me. And we'll speed through these 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 last three because we're behind on time. But the Raptors were kind of the team I thought the Pacers would be. I thought they would be up in those that top four to five because that's what they do every year. They're one and five. Again, it's early, but they're shooting terribly. That'll get better. Um, the 29th in offense and still second in defense. So that defense is still great, but offensively, I think, I, I think maybe we underestimated the loss of Ibaka and Gasol, um, especially in the half court offense, because we know this team is great in, in transition, but not when things slow down. And I think obviously Mark with his passing and Serge with his pick and pop, they help that offense move a lot. And now they're with, they have, um, instead they have Baines starting. Uh, Boucher, Boucher, Boucher coming off the Boucher. bench. And they're just not as good as Ibaka and, and Gasol. And I think that hurts them more than I thought it would. Now, I, am I going to pick them to miss the playoffs? No. But I, I hesitate to think now, given what I've seen, that with an offense like they have right now, they can be a top four seed in the East. Yeah, I think top four seed might be a stretch. And I think for sure the departure of those two bigs and then also just Pascal. I don't know what it is if if teams have just figured out his moves, if he's in a slump, if it's um, you know psychologically or or mentally messing up with his routine. Because as we saw, and he, he talked about that being a factor in the bubble and just not adjusting to it well and. Yeah, before now, the bubble, I'm pretty sure he even mentioned that he didn't play any basketball for three months leading up right. to the bubble. <clears throat> right. And now they're in Tampa and still, like, outside of their normal routine and their normal, you know, training facilities and all of that. So, you know, I don't, I don't know to the extent that that is impacting his play and what that means for the future, if that's something that, you know, is going to change as he settles in or what, but it's like, I don't know, pretty concerning where last year, wasn't he like third team all NBA last year? And, yep. you know, we're, we're like, Oh yeah. He basically stepped up and replaced like 90% of what Kawhi was for that team. And now he's like barely above replacement level. I feel like for them. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if we're going to ever see that Pascal again. Yeah. Kyle, any thoughts on the Raptors? Um, obviously, like we've said, they're one of the best defensive teams in the league. That's not a question. Um, they have the GOAT. They have OG. So um, <laughs> it really just bolsters the defense and can defend anyone. But uh, Nick Nurse, I don't know if you you guys probably haven't been following as closely as I have, but after every single game, he's been calling out by name so many different players and just saying, like, specifically Norman Powell has gotten it quite a bit. Um, him and um, – oh, who else he called out? Him and uh, Matt Thomas. He's just like, there are two best scorers, and right now 
they're shooting worse than I'm pretty sure anyone in the league is essentially what he says. Like we can't go on and play games like this. Uh, our team is 100% better than what we're playing at right now, but we just, we can't score. So he knows it. There's just something like these are Norman Powell and Matt Thomas are two what were rather efficient scores last year. And I don't think just over a short off season that just like disappears. They're just in right. a funk right now. So yeah. I'm not worried at all. They're going to make the playoffs. What I think I had them, right. I think I had them as a top four team. That's still not out of the question. We're only seven, eight games into the season. So yeah, I'm not too worried. Red Van Vliet's looking solid. great. OG is looking great. Yeah. Uh, Seth, who's your, what's your third most surprising thing? Yes. Yeah, so this is another one where it's, you know, we had kind of saw this coming similar to Christian Wood um, where all three of us, I think, and a lot of other people like this team um, to really improve on last year. And that's the Phoenix Suns. Um, so they're five and two right now. And really to me, it's, it's adding in Chris Paul to a team that already was looking really good, obviously eight and no in the bubble at the end of last year. And what's been surprising for me was some of the contributions from some of those other other players, Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Jay Crowder, Saric, like having all of those pieces um, to go along with kind of your your main trio with Chris, Booker, and Aiton was really like those those guys have been coming through. And you know, I really think it's it's having someone like Chris Paul, who's one of the greatest players in the league at running an offense, at facilitating, at getting people the ball in situations where they can succeed. You know, I think that has worked wonders for this team, taking pressure off of Devin Booker where he can focus on, um, you know, doing, doing what he does best and being efficient rather than trying to just carry the team on his shoulders so I really like this team to keep it up, and I'm just so fun to see the the Suns good again, and you know can't wait to see how they match up with some of these other top teams in the West, especially in the playoffs. Yeah, I love watching this team so far, and you can really tell like I've seen it late in games a couple times. I've watched them adding Chris Paul just just really ensures that you get the best shot at the end of games whether he's taking it or facilitating. I've seen that already a couple of times. Um, no, I wouldn't say a fadeaway mid-range jumper from Chris Call- Paul is one of the best shots there is, but I'm just joking around with you. <laughs> oh, I would. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's been great to watch. Aiden haven't, hasn't even been good yet. So, you know, when he he's finds his role. the last, like, two, three games, he's been. Yeah, I think he's starting to find his role in this offense, and when he does, I think they can even be more potent than they already are. So, I, I might I might have been too low on them coming to the season when I thought they were a solid, you know, seventh or eighth seed. I think they could they could easily get a top six seed. So I'm excited to watch this team play for the rest of the season. Yeah, I'm with you too. And the I've been all on all aboard the Mikel Bridges breakout year. And man, he looks fantastic. Like he has no hesitation in his offensive game anymore. He's a lockdown defender. Um he's awesome. And then Obviously, the the Jay Crowder 3 and D has been great for them, right? They just kind of have at least their starting five um, really has what you're looking for in a starting five, right, in this this NBA. I would like to formally announce that Mikhail Bridges has taken the throne from Sean Livingston as the league's most disgusting arms. (laughs) that trail <laughs> down I don't know, man. further Christian than his Wood knees. Has some long fucking arms too. That's true. <laughs> but he's a but bitch. Still, so I guess it's expected. I watched Mikael Bridges and I'm like, his, he could tie his shoes without bending over. It's disgusting. <laughs> All right, yeah. Kyle, give us your last surprising thing to round us out here. Um, last thing, Tyrese Halliburton. Mm. I mean – we talked about him before the draft, not much on the podcast because we were kind of going over what mocks were and mocks had him falling. Uh, but before kind of mock, like the, the deep mock draft right before the draft, the Bulls were kind of expected to get Halliburton. That's what a lot of people were projecting. And it seems like, I mean, 
don't get me wrong, Patrick Williams surprisingly has looked much better than I expected. Uh, but Tyrese Halliburton is a different breed, dude. He is like he's not requiring you know a ton of usage. He's not starting, but he doesn't need to. He's already like there were five games in. He's being relied on to run the entire second unit. Uh, he's closing games already during timeouts, during media stops. He's sitting there at the end of games telling other players on the Sun or on the Suns on um, <laughs> the Kings on the Kings. Jesus. I hope he's not telling oh, his opponents where to go. <laughs> <laughs> telling them where they need to be, what they need to watch out for. Like he's a floor general already in his first six games of the season. Um, and it's just so evident at how much he brings to this team. Just so even the last two games for for the Kings, they've just looked nowhere near as good when he has been out because he's been injured. Um, yeah. It's just crazy. Like he might be the most NBA ready player and he fell all the way to the Kings in this draft. It's, it's crazy. I wonder what's going to happen with rookie of the year because <clears throat> like he's not going to put up gaudy stats, but if you watch the games, he's so important to this team. And I just wonder in a year like this with not that many studs, if he does sneak right. into that conversation, you know, will people value the stats or, or will they value just his winning attributes? I think for me, he's been the best rookie I've seen this year so far, but I'm not sure the statistics will reflect that, you know? He reminds me of Brogdon, um, who was also someone who was yeah. NBA ready, didn't really feel like he had a huge high ceiling, um, but we've seen how valuable he is to teams. And he did win Rookie of the Year, and that was one where, you know, there are a lot of injuries and Embiid only played yeah, 29 games or whatever it was. But so, I mean, it'll, we'll see how that goes. And, um, you know, maybe my man Peyton Pritchard will give him a run for his money. But yeah, he's more he's looks good. Yeah, I've already put, you know, I've already – actually put money on Tyrese to win rookie of the year. So yeah. I heard you wagered uh, your mortgage on that. Is that true? Yeah, just about <laughs> um, find a new house uh, at the end of this season. But no, one of the things I think too, you know, I don't know how much voters put into uh, teams or, or rookies whose teams make the playoffs. But mm. I think of the rookies right now that are like, in the conversation for rookie of the year, the Kings are a dark horse to sneak in as an eight seed. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I don't think LaMelo going to play more. He's going to definitely put up more counting stats most likely, but they're not making the playoffs in the East. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Not sure the Warriors are even going to make the playoffs anymore. Um, James Wiseman still looks raw, but he's going to put up stats too. If the Kings could sneak in and Tyrese is one of the reasons I like those odds. I think I got yeah, another, I agree. what was it plus eighteen to one or something. That is it for the NBA. Let's move on to what everyone's waiting for: the NFL playoffs. Time for our wacky, wild, wild card weekend preview. Patent pending. Um, before we start, I can already tell you one of Kyle's picks. It'll be the Washington football team over the Bucks. We all know it. It has all the elements he loves: an underdog. Going against Tom Brady. So just mark that in right now. An injured Mike Evans who sucks anyways, even though he's the only player to ever put up a thousand yards for his first seven seasons of his career. Who cares? Exactly. At but what cost? That's not where we're starting. We're starting with the Colts at the Bills. First game on Saturday. Bills. We must apologize too, to our one listener, Nick Merlina, who uh, I think we said could come on this. Um, preview podcast for NFL playoffs, but we know he's oh, yeah. busy. He's engaged. He's got a dog. And uh it's a wild card weekend. He's working so he can't he has no time for us. Well, if the Colts win we'll have so. him on. How about that? Right, yeah. He's doing um, ACT prep. He's a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so the Bills have suddenly become the darlings of the AFC. See a lot of people out there saying that they should be the favorites to make the Super Bowl. Not sure I'm quite there yet, but they are Fourth and DVOA, which you know I love. Um, Colts, surprisingly, Jonathan Taylor was third in rushing yards this year, despite uh, the coaches sitting him every other game for fumbling. So <laughs> that's not surprising that's, to me. Yeah, that's a big matchup there against the uh, the weak Bills running defense. So, how do we see this game going, guys? 
this game is interesting because I really want to pick the Colts to win, but at the same time, you just can't overlook the fact that what Josh Allen has done, especially the last three, four weeks, uh, especially with Stephon Diggs and Cole Beasley, and they're not even running the ball. They might have, they might have less than 10 rush attempts this weekend, and that's scary with how accurate he's become and just how incredible the rest of their playmakers are um, and how good of an offensive coordinator Brian DeBowl is. So I'm going to go with the Bills against my – against my want of the Colts to win just because, you know, I love Jonathan Taylor. Running backs don't matter, but rookie running backs do. You heard to hear Seth. first. Seth? Yeah. I mean, the Bills have just shown us too much over the – especially the second half of the year to pick against them here in the first round. Their offense is just so powerful. Diggs and Beasley, the <clears throat> most wide receiver yards of any duo in the league this year. So – I'm definitely taking the Bills. And, and Cole Beasley's dropping it. a rap track tonight to at midnight, so it's over, know that. it's over for the Colts. Bills the by Colts, a lot. The Colts fucked me in the survivor pool, so they fucked all my god. The first we week. talk about the fact that we all got out of survival pool week one to the one team that's got the number one overall pick in the NFL draft to They're the team that didn't lose season. a game, didn't win a game the rest of the season. <laughs> it's outrageous. I also, I was looking at known, the standings and. Would you believe that no team went three and thirteen this year? So we should just start a we should start a scoregami Twitter account, but for random <laughs> NFL uh, records. Yeah, Record um, I'm going to take the Bills in this game, like you guys said. I honestly wish both these teams were playing someone different because I would want to pick them both. You know, I like I, I like the Colts, and I think the Bills are great, but I'll take the Bills in this game. Next game, we can breeze over. I'm not actually that excited about this game. I've seen it right twice this year. Um, but we have the Rams at the Seahawks, midday Saturday. Uh, the Rams – I'm sorry, the Seahawks favored by four. So, for the Rams, Goff may not play, which, honestly, does that really make a difference? We, we got, got John, boy John, John Walford, baby. From- John Walford, yeah, and Cup should be back, so that helps them. Um, Seth, why don't you just start and tell us why you think the Seahawks, the Seahawks are going to win? I mean, Russell Wilson, the love of my life. Uh, Who's not one. throwing nowhere near as much as he was at the beginning of the season. It's true. It honestly is a bit concerning. Um, but if you're choosing between Russell Wilson and John Wolford. That's just I mean, one player, though, on each team. I know. It's a quarterback, which is the, arguably the most important position. In I can tell you right now that – Russ is probably going to have under 25 passing attempts, and that's not a recipe for success. We got Chris a pound under in this game. And Carlos pound. Hyde are definitely each going to have at yeah. least 18 touches each. So, Kyle, you have the guts to pick the Rams? I do. Yeah, I'm picking the Rams. I could have, I should have said that before, too. I would, I would have known that as one of your picks. Yep. You know, I honestly just don't feel like either of these teams are making the, the conference championship. I don't know. I don't like either of these oh, teams. Oh, no, I don't like either of them to make the conference championship. Honestly, I wagered – I told you guys I wagered on the Rams before the season at 15-1. to 1. I've already cashed that out and made my money back yeah. because I, I didn't even you want the 15-1. to 1. Yeah. <laughs> um, so both these teams are ass. I'll take the Seahawks um, because I like Russ, and I yeah, yeah. just don't like what I see from the Rams. But I'm... I wouldn't be surprised if the Rams win this game. Yeah, I mean, no one's going to be surprised. A lot of people are going to expect them to win the game, but I'd be surprised. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I mean, Pete Carroll just recently said, like, our defense is playing better. We don't need to throw as much. That's not how it works. Just because you have a good defense doesn't mean that you destroy your offense. Like, I was, I was about to say, terrible analogy. Not even an analogy. I was about to say, uh, I mean, Seattle wins the coaching battle. Pete Carroll over Sean McVay. So <laughs> that alone. I mean, who was in the playoff or who was in the um, the Super Bowl most recent? Who has won a Super Bowl? Huh? Who decided to throw the ball at the one yard line when Marshawn Lynch was on your team? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. Was, so that'll be. I, hated that. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty bored of that game already. Let's get that over with. Both neither team's going to make it far anyway. Now the aforementioned. Uh, Bucks at the Washington football team. Outrageous that we have a 7 and 9 team hosting a playoff game. Bucks are favored by eight and a half. So we've had two sub 500 teams make the playoffs and they've both won. I don't know what that means for us. And we've also had two underdogs this big at home and they both won. 
So, <laughs> though none it makes of those, me a little nervous. Yeah, but none of those have been playing Tom Brady, to my knowledge. So, I mean, this would be Tom Brady's Brady worst oldest ever. age he's ever been. True, can't his, argue with that. Number we one all receiver are. out. <laughs> We've all never been as old as we are. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> um, Kyle, why don't you go on a rant about why they shouldn't, why they should have rested their starters last week and not gotten Mike Evans injured? I mean, obviously, that's exactly why. They wanted to get Mike Evans a record. I get it. You want to be in the NFL record books. But he was immediately carted off the field after his catch that broke the record by like six <laughs> yards. That's I'm not, karma. Im- not impressed. And I don't really care. Like, Mike Evans sucks. He's a compiler. He's not a playmaker by any means. Ugh. He's just a force at toss him up the ball. He'll grab it, but he'll do nothing else for you. <laughs> Isn't that luckily, what he's supposed to do? Luckily for them, <laughs> he won't throw added, it. <laughs> luckily for them, they've added two of the best yak players in the league, or not added, have Chris Godwin and Antonio Brown. So that helps. But Chris Godwin's a free agent after this year. Antonio Brown, fuck him. Because he said no white women 2020. Look where we are now. Fuck Antonio Brown. <laughs> oh, I got to say, at least. At least part of the reason you're so upset is because they don't have Jameis Winston anymore. That too. <laughs> um, so you're picking the Washington football team, as we know. Yeah, I mean, Montez Sweat and Chase Young are going to – they might rip off Tom Brady's foot. <laughs> oh, my God. So graphic. Yeah, Honestly, does Montez Duke Sweat have the best – has Sneaky have the best uh, name in sports? It's close. It's up there. I mean – Equinemius St. Brown, pretty good. But Montez And then Sweat's next nice. year when his brother comes in the league, Amon Ross St. Brown, he's definitely going to take it over. Wow. Um, I'm going to take the Bucks in this game. But honestly, would I be shocked if they lost? Yes. I think that it's so funny because like I could see them making the Super Bowl if they just beat Green Bay. And then I could also see them losing this game just because they get so much pressure on Tom. I don't know. I'm not going to bet on this game. I'm staying away. I'm just going to see what happens. Washington but... the point. This is the craziest comeback player of the year story we've ever seen. Somehow, obviously losing division, led his team into the playoffs against a washed-up Tom Brady. What, what a storybook this would be to win the playoff game, too, as the comeback player of the year after you almost had to have your leg taken off of your body. That would be an incredible storyline. Is that the Bucks? I'm all narrative street. Also, Montez Sweat, that's not his full name. Montez is his middle name. His first name is Shaquam Montez Sweat. Best name in sports. Okay, easy. Why does he go by Shaquam? Easily, yeah, really. That's like half my name. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I don't have the guts to take the Washington football team. I'll be cheering for them. I think that would be, that'd be awesome to see. Um. And I'm not a huge Brady fan, just in general. But I just – Bucks have looked really good the last half of the year. And I feel like Washington really just isn't that good. So anything can happen. It's football. I'll be cheering for it. But I'm not going to – I'm not going to pick them. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. This may be the next – this next game I think is probably the best game of the weekend in my estimation. We got the Ravens at the Titans uh, at noon Sunday. Ravens are favored by three, with that, which I thought was semi surprising. Yeah. Um, well, we saw this game last year in the playoffs, and the Titans prevailed, which it's is kind bit. of why I was like, "Why are the Ravens favored?" I do realize that the Titans are much worse defensively this year, but they're really not. And, though here's the thing: last year we came in, we went into the playoffs. Ravens obviously thought of as if the best, if not the second best team in the league, riding it high. This year, they started off slow. They had to get their footing underneath them. They're peaking right as the playoffs are starting this year, and people are still thinking of them as the team from the beginning of the season where they weren't blowing people out, where they weren't playing great football. Now they are. And on top of that, They've essentially, over the offseason coming into this year, added players to their defense kind of essentially to combat the way the Titans play football. 
They're just going to load the line. Obviously, you know, Tannehill is going to do what he does. He's a second tier QB in this league, right? According to me. <laughs> so AJ Brown's going to have a good game, I think. I do think they contain Derrick Henry. But I don't think I don't think the Tennessee Titans can can stop what what uh, the Ravens and Lamar is going to bring to them this weekend. Yeah, I was saying the Titans are better defensively. Or worse Not, defensively, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the thing with the Ravens is, like, people are saying they're hot. They're hot, and they are. But, I mean, they beat the Cowboys, Jaguars, Giants, and Bengals to get in. I mean, they had that one impressive win over the Browns when Lamar pooped and then came back in an astounding fashion. But other than that, they beat the, all, the four worst teams in the league. So am I supposed to be impressed? Like, I, this is what Lamar and the Ravens do, right? They destroy bad teams. I'd like to see them beat a good team. So I'm a little skeptical, but I do think that this is a little more even and different matchup than last year, like you were saying, Kyle. I just don't know if I'm ready to back the Ravens yet until I see it, you know? I'm backing the Ravens here. They're going to win. Seth, what are you, who are you taking? I'm taking the Titans. Um, I think, <clears throat> like you said, we saw this game last year. And mind you, last year I was all in on the Titans winning. We also saw this game earlier this year and the Titans won again, so I just don't know what I'm supposed to go off of. <laughs> exactly. I just haven't been that impressed with Baltimore this year. I know you're saying they're they're peaking at the right time, and, you know, that could be right. But as we know, running backs matter a tremendous amount, and <laughs> Tennessee has one of the best ones. And I think Tennessee is the team where – if they're behind, they can throw with Tannehill, hook up with A.J. Brown. They can make big plays. If they're ahead, they have an incredible run game, and they can run out the clock. And, and the Ravens, the it feels about like the Ravens, though. I just don't have as much confidence in Lamar throwing the ball. or The their, thing is, though, Lamar doesn't have to weapons. throw the ball to change a game. He could change a game with his legs. True. Listen, this is the top, most toss-up game of the weekend for me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take the Titans until I see it, but if the Ravens want to show me that they can beat a good team, I'll be glad to see it. Like, I love Lamar. I, I'm, you know, I'd be happy to see that. They just haven't Big had trust. playoff success Ooh. yet. <laughs> Big trust. Um, let's go to the next game. Our Chicago Bears <laughs> at the Saints. Midday Sunday. Saints are favored by 9.5. Should probably be 17.5. Um, Kyle, why don't you just tell me why the Bears are going to win? I wish I could, and I've been trying to talk myself into it for wow. days, for days. But I just – trust me, I'm rooting for the Bears through and through, but I can't say that they're going to win the game. I did see that – this is crazy, but at 40-1 to 1 odds, you could bet on um, Alvin Kamara to lead uh, – players in the postseason in receiving yards if they end up playing all the way through to the Super Bowl he has an extra game on top of anyone from Green Bay or Kansas City and we know that yeah I can see that, that. they love to toss the ball to him underneath yeah I was gonna say that that's people are, are always saying like Drew Brees has a noodle arm, or maybe that's just us he saying does that. Have a, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and we're right. But the thing is, it reminds me of, obviously, two completely different teams. It reminds me of the Super Bowl that the Bears were in a few years ago. Not a few. I don't know. I was like 11, but it seems like only yesterday. <laughs> where Peyton Manning just threw short passes and just diced us up because that's the way to be the defense that we had. Similar thing in this game, I think. Drew Brees is smart. He knows how to get those passes off. We, we, it was stark in watching Taysom Hill try to make those passes when he, with him not being able to. Um, and I think with the kind of pressure that our defense brings, that's what you would do to beat us. So I don't see this game going well for this. I'll take the Saints. Um, obviously, I'd be ecstatic if the Bears won, but I don't see a large chance of that happening. Yeah, in our little uh, playoff prediction pool, um, confidence pool, I'm putting 10 on this game. I was saved the most for the Super Bowl to make it fun, but this is going to be my lock of the week, if you will, taking mm -hmm. the Saints. Well, you got to put 12 on it then because we have 13 points this year. 
Mm, good point. 12. Now, I, haven't looked at it I can see the Bears winning if they get to, obviously, it, it all comes down to the defense. And if we're going to get, if we're going to pressure Drew Brees, I think we have a chance. Yeah. Last well, week we don't. against, against, against Green Bay, I feel like we were kind of in a decent position at halftime. We were in a good position at halftime, but the second half, I think I saw like two or three dropped what should have been interceptions. If they just catch those balls, we'd probably beat Green Bay last week. Honestly, I just – we don't even deserve to be in the playoffs. I mean, we're 8-8. Eight and eight. We're only in because there's a 7 seed added. But I'll enjoy it while it happens. Better than the Redskins. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Washington football team, please. Uh, all right, last game. I can't – I just can't get up for this. I just, I'm not too pumped about this game. I don't know why it's a Sunday night game. Like, you can't, can't have anything better there. It's because the Browns it's at the two Steelers. of the biggest rivals in NFL history. What do you mean? It's the Browns at the Steelers. It's two unwatchable offenses with one of their coaches sidelined. Uh, we have the Browns coach they, will not be there. If he was sidelined. Wouldn't he be at the game then? And the coach is always on the sideline. Anyway, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're missing one of their offensive guards too due to COVID. Uh, Steelers, last I checked, were six point favorites. I don't know if that's gone up at all. But listen, the Browns made the playoffs for the first time since 2002. I'm happy for them. I'm rooting for them this game, but I just don't think they have a chance. Um, I mean, we already saw the Steelers crush the Browns 38 to 7 earlier in the year. Nearly beat them last year with Mason Rudolph at quarterback or last week, excuse me, with Mason Rudolph at quarterback and sitting a lot of their starters. Anyone going to try to talk me out of the Steelers winning this? I mean, I, I just don't see a chance for the Browns. No, sir. What do you mean you don't see a chance for the Browns? See, that's what I wanted. Thank you. Let, talk me into it. I mean, the Steelers have had an anemic offense the second half, the entire second half, just as we said, they most, at least I did, said that they could because the first half they had those cake matchups. They were throwing short passes, relying on, you know, yards after the catch and whatnot. And really the only player that could perform in that sense is Deontay. Juju's kind of been ass. Uh, They have absolutely no running game at all. I don't – no one could run the ball on that team. And Big Ben is just completely trash. He's washed. He can't take the Browns. He's just as bad, maybe if not worse, than Drew Brees. Yeah. I'm yeah, taking, taking the, Browns, the Browns, though. That's all I yeah. want to know. I am. You are? Mm hmm. Wow. All right. For me, it's like Mike Tomlin versus a COVID coach. That's a tough, that's a tough spot for the Browns. I mean, I don't even care. It's... You don't care that the coach of the year is out for this game? No. Coaches don't matter. Neither do running backs, nor do quarterbacks, because we got Wolford. He's going to beat the Seahawks. It's one game. (laughs) They know what Stefanski Uh, wants. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe that won't be that big of a deal. but Maybe it's better if Baker just gets to freestyle a little bit. Who knows? Yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) All right, well, we've lost Seth. I don't even know where he is anymore, but that's all we have for the podcast anyway. So, Kyle, I guess we have to close it out. Oh, I know just the thing to close it out with. Okay. So, obviously, against the $40 million man last night and no Kevin Durant and a starting lineup that consisted of Kyrie Irving, Bruce Brown Jr., Timothy Luau Cabarro, Torian Prince, and finally, Jared Allen gets a start against the Stifle Tower. Went completely berserk, right? They asked him what happened. He said, normally, I'm a pesto on my pasta kind of guy. But today, I went with Alfredo. That's what I think fueled my game tonight. <laughs> Coach, if you need to do something in your life at a little bit higher level, change it up. Don't put that pesto on your pasta. Toss some Alfredo in that shit. Words to live by.